That's the moment in my life that I define as trying to go into a normal life. Are you ready? All right. Hi there, I'm Nora Dunn, and I'm otherwise known as the professional hobo, and welcome to my series where I speak with ordinary people who have extraordinary remote careers and travel lifestyles. Before I introduce my guest today, I encourage you to have a look at the description for a bevy of interesting links, including a link to your very own free checklist of 10 crucial things you need to do before you travel long term. This will help set the groundwork for the travel lifestyle. Also, of course, I always appreciate a thumbs up and a comment because this helps my videos and my series get discovered by other people like you. Now, my guest today is Isabel Paco. Born in the Parisian suburbs, Isabel discovered the joys of alternative travel as a teenager while following the festivals across Europe. She learned how to hitchhike and how to live in a truck and camp and live on a shoestring budget and adapt quickly. Very good travel skills. In the early 2000s, she studied languages in Berlin and then journalism in London, and that is where she met her first digital nomads. Fascinated by these pioneers, she set up her online business and then went on the road with no return date. Her journey led her to working from the rooftops of Kathmandu to the benches of the Trans-Siberian Railway and more. Today, Isabel is a translator, guidebook author, and travel guide for anxious people. I'm really excited to dig into all of this and more. Welcome, Isabel. Thank you for joining me today. Hi. <laughs> So I want to set some context here. Uh, the reason I wanted to speak with you today is because I remember you and I actually met in 2013, I believe, when you were getting ready for this lifestyle and you hired me as a consultant in order to help you prepare and get all the logistics together. But one of the things that I remember you asking me about a lot was how to overcome some of the barriers, uh, what family and friends who don't understand, because in France, this just wasn't a common lifestyle and what you were doing was not really understood. So I would love it if you could tell me what it was like to become a digital nomad in France. Well, to be fair, I didn't even know that many freelancers. That's how isolated I felt at the moment with my project, because even at the time, just having basic information about freelancing, just having a, a remote business, a re remote business was actually, yeah, it was, it was um, not common. So everything together, just learning some travel skills, international travel skills, plus uh, how to grow a business, which is hard even if when it's not remote, and then learn how to freelance and everything from the taxes to, yeah, everything administrative and finances and everything. Everything was just a bit daunting, but I couldn't let go of the project and I knew some people were doing it. So that really helped me, the example. I don't think I would have been able to do it if I didn't know some people were already kind of starting doing it. But um, yeah, um, that I think I wanted to do it, but I didn't know where to start. I felt really overwhelmed. And what kind of work were you initially doing when you started your remote career? In the, I was a journalist before I started uh, being a digital nomad and I, was, I got into expatriation uh, before. So I lived in different countries before, but that was very different, of course, from freelancing. I always found job in the legit way um, because in Europe, especially, you can definitely um, work in many countries legally. And in the US, I was au pair. So I did all this kind of techniques to work abroad. Um, but then I got hired in a startup that taught me some skills uh, as it was in the beginning of uh, SEO uh, and you know when Google was really gaining momentum. Um, so it was a while ago. Um, but yeah, that's where I learned a lot of skills uh, by accident kind of. And I got into translation and after that, um, that's where I realized, okay, I could, I could do that. In the beginning, I wanted to write. Of course, I think that was something that I love to do, but we, I actually remember you and I talking about how quicker, how much quicker it would be to actually earn some money with other skills. And that's for sure. I still write today and I still would love to make it, definitely develop this uh, like on the long term, but to earn some money, uh, it's definitely more reliable to have another skill that is very much on demand. Uh, online and translation is one of them. 
when you hit the road, your your career then was a combination of freelance writing, journalism, and translation. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. But I was getting paid in the beginning almost only with translation and some kind of SEO work like uh, keyword research, uh, these kind of tasks. I don't even know today uh, what they're called, but at the time it was just like spreadsheets and keywords to put into Google. And I mean, not Google, but I mean, I was working with a company that was dealing with the back end of this. Um, but yeah, that was uh, just, I don't even think that job exists anymore, really. I don't know. <laughs> Like, oh yeah, like SEO it. marketing is definitely still a thing. No, it's, it's a fine I know, art. I used to do it like very uh, low tech way. <laughs> I think now it's probably much more automated. Um, but the way I used to do it is probably so different. Even from one month to another, everything changed in this industry. So I don't think now today I would qualify to, to do this. But at the time, it was very handy and very nifty and uh, just a good way to, to earn money online. Well, this begs a great question, uh, because obviously your career has evolved uh, many times yeah. over since those days. So before we get into the lifestyle part, perhaps you can tell me how your career has changed over the years and, and led you to what you're doing now. Yeah, it's it's. Um, I always pictured myself uh, as someone who would um, accept um, any job as long as I can do it remotely, legally, of course, and that I was uh, that I would be able to do it without suffering too much. Like, I don't know, no, for example, um, like customer service or stuff on the phone that was just really not my thing. So any kind of job that I would be able to do reasonably okay, um, I would take. And that led me to an interesting road because that's how I got into this startup. Um, and I ended up really liking it. And I think at this point, it's important to say that I have ADHD and I that's the kind of, life that I thrive on with lear constantly learning stuff, not having so much safety net. So I didn't have many, I mean, I can't say I had like a lot of structure to support me like a career path or I don't know, um, not much stability, um, but I was learning new skills and that was super helpful because of course the, the that, that industry kept on growing and working online kept on growing. And so I was actually in the right time um at the right place at the right time and i was cons I, I kept on evolving with the field um so i kind of had a heads up uh from in fact in front of a lot of people if that makes sense because i started early in that in that game so what are you doing now and what happened in between i'm translating i'm translating mostly but not only uh mm -hmm. translation also is a really weird name, but it's the closest I can think of, but it can be anything. I mean, it can be transliteration, it can, it can be writing, it can be proofreading. Uh, I'm proofreading in French also. So it's kind of anything that's into, um, I mean, a lot of correction, um, website translations, uh, paper, document translation, it can be a lot of things. And also I write, but it's it's uh, something that I'm learning to do um, in the edition industry for, for books. So it's kind of new, before I was into press, uh, so that was different. Um, but I, that was always on and off because it really depends on projects. Usually there is a moment where I have all these projects in writing and then not much, and then all these projects. So in between, I'm really happy to have this translation business going on. How do you find the translation gigs? It's a hard question to answer because again, because I was there in the beginning and I was working with the startup, they were the first, I mean, now they're not a startup, they're a company, but they, they actually gave me the first gigs. And then from then onwards, I kind of got contacted a lot. I think at the time it was through LinkedIn, um, but now I never contact people anymore. I got contacted and I have two, three clients that provide anything I need really. So I don't need to find new ones, but if I had to uh, advise someone to, to go into this, I mean, if I had to give some, give some advice, I would say go on websites that, um, have translation agencies to, uh, that they post jobs. So it's a bit of a jungle in the beginning because you got good ones and bad ones, good agencies and bad agencies. But if you find a good one, usually they stop posting these ads online and they keep on contacting you without going through the, they don't post the job offerings online. They just go through and they, are you interested? And they have this pool of translate. It's just 
through agencies, I think is the best uh, bet. I have some friends who do it differently. They go straight to big clients and say, do you want me to do your website? Because it's really badly translated, for example. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't do it because it's a lot of work. Obviously, it's just a cold calling and stuff like that. So I'd rather, um, yeah, just wait to get contacted. Well, I mean, if you can get the jobs through word of mouth and without having to pound the yeah. pavement, as it were, then absolutely. It's that's now you mentioned a little bit earlier about the the feast and famine world of yeah. writing and yeah. and what that it, kind of freelance work is. How do you find your freelance writing gigs? It's kind of the same. Um, <laughs> in the beginning, there was years and years of nothing and, you know, rejection letters and everything. Um, and yet at some point you do, you have the trust of someone who thinks you're actually doing a good job. And from that moment on, so it's a bit of luck. Like, of course, it's, you do have to have this one first client or this one first gig. You do have to have this one foot in the door. But once this is done, this is getting, this, everything gets easier. And I have this strong feeling that it's happening right now for translation for me, but it might probably happen for writing. It's just, I'm not there yet. I'm not in a situation where I have enough to show so that I don't even have to look anymore. The opportunities come to me, but it can happen. I think it's a matter of time and just there, it's not so much a big break because I don't think in my industry, I don't think there is a big break or anything. People don't know you by your name, but they just know your reputation and that's enough. So they, they contact you and then it's easier for them to have one person to work with. It's the same as press or journalism or you know if you know you can trust someone it's just you, you'd rather go there rather than take a risk and and hire someone new but then at some point you do need someone new because maybe you have a so too much work for one person so you th these people look online and this is the moment where you can actually enter so you you do have to reply to a lot of job offers in the beginning and you just finished a really interesting gig you were updating a lonely planet guidebook yeah uh, what was that like? This is usually considered a, a dream job for uh, for anyone who's travel writing and whatnot. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like? It was amazing for me, especially this guidebook. I don't believe it's translated yet, but it's it's a book that's a little bit more on the um, coffee table uh, books side, and it's um, it led me to do everything that I love, which is researching on topics that I'm passionate about, uh, namely travel, which for me is a topic that is kind of like light you know you just it's just never ending uh research you can do and um interviewing great people and uh and uh, whoever <laughs> might you mean yeah <laughs> but, i got interviewed yeah. for the book just <laughs> so <Yeah>. anyone's wondering <laughs> <laughs> no but it's great because this is this was the moment for me to do this uh synthesis where when i just realized okay i remember this person and this person helped me and this person person inspired me and then I wish I could just let people know that these people exist and they have great stuff to say and so I got to do this and put all this in a book and I I'm so happy about this and I'm so proud of this and you were one of them of course because you inspired me but you know we already said that to each other so <laughs> well thank you uh, and, it, and it sounds like your career continues to be fully remote do you have any plans going forward for you know do you, you, are you thinking forward to making any changes or are you just going to keep on track and see what comes where, where what are you projecting is going to happen in the years to come it's i don't see the incentive for me to not be remote and as long as it's the case i think i will stay remote um i think that it's getting easier and easier now and we have more and more incentive as a french people at least to to stay remote because before i was giving up a lot uh, i was giving up a lot in terms of uh, safety net and uh, regulations to protect workers or even uh, social security all this kind of stuff so i was giving up uh, much but now it's getting because the uh, working as a freelancer gets more and more uh, institutional then I start to get stuff that I didn't have before so I mean there is even uh, maternity leave now for freelancers in France you can get paid so you know all this kind of stuff start to develop and because of that I don't see why I would not be remote mm -hmm. well and, and the pandemic of course has, has necessitated yeah. people to become remote so you were already ahead of the curve when that happened which was a yeah. blessing I'm sure yes. To me, in the beginning of the pandemic, felt really crazy because I actually re realized for me it was just kind of business as usual. 
<laughs> yeah. And a lot of people were just so happy to be to work remotely because for them it was just the ultimate dream to work from home. And and I was I was happy for them because it's actually great to work from home. Um, but at the time I felt like, yeah, for many, many people in the world, it is the first time. And yeah, it's exciting. But it, for me, it was just a Monday, let's just go back to work. So <laughs> Um, so I'd like to to now backtrack and uh, you know we covered the last uh, I don't know ten years of your career. Now let's let's backtrack and cover the last ten years of your lifestyle, and yeah. how that has been uh, since you started working remotely. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've made I've I've burnt out quite a lot. Um, I think it would have happened regardless of me traveling or working remotely. Um, it's just how I function. I tend to not really listen to my limits um, until it's too late. Uh, obviously that gets better with age <laughs> because you know there is a bit less mistakes I guess to make or not big mistakes anymore. I think traveling and working remotely helped me learn quicker. Um, and um, I think, I, I'm, I'm not sure I could say it's so the, the, we say life hygiene in France, does it make sense? Like the, what you do every day to make sure you can function on the long long run like maybe self-care in a way self-care but, yeah yeah but not even I mean, it's, it's very the yeah, hygiene is a good word it's just you brush mm -hmm. your teeth you you meditate kind of thing. um but i don't think it's very different when i travel from when i'm at home um i tend to go i'm, I'm very fond of regularity um so try to keep routines um to kind of create artificial um time blocks and so I do this when I travel as well and yeah um, I think I mean I've learned so so much on about how I function through these mistakes and so because of this now I can definitely say I found a sweet spot and yeah I tend to live kind of the same way abroad and in France. So you were, um, you know, the definition of digital nomad is a moving target. But, uh, you know, if we were to say that a digital nomad is someone who has no home, technically, you know, proverbially homeless, yeah. how long were you a digital nomad and what did you do over those years? Um, and when was this? I will technically, I mean, so when I first moved to Berlin, it, it's a bit hard for me this definition I, I totally get it and I think it's a good definition but to me I when I was a student in Berlin I technically didn't have a home uh, <laughs> and I made a lot of experiments with uh, living in huge uh, uh, flat chair and I even squatted in Berlin for a while because basically at the time it was just that's, that's the thing to do in Berlin <laughs> yeah and it was I mean again I didn't see why I wouldn't do this it was just technically yeah I was squatting but I mean we were living with many people and the flight was just kind of safe and nice and I mean you know I just went with the flow and um so all this time I was technically doing something let's say normal I was a student an abroad student but accommodation wise and lifestyle wise I, I was doing all this free accommodation thing um a lot or very very cheap and kind of and so i didn't really i was not doing like official paperwork of having a home so let's say and that lasted for a long time especially because i was just not very i, I don't know for me it was very daunting so usually i tended to sublet through gumtree at the time so like you know little uh, uh classified Mm -hmm. stuff like that so it's just kind of always winging it and so technically yeah it was my flat but it was always short term and or you know a roommate would say can would you live to my house you know can we would live together but I would pay the rent to them or so always this kind of stuff makes me feel like I've been a digital nomad for a very long time very long time and um yeah I I and then on the road again, I sometimes I was doing exactly that. It's a it's a fascinating 
thing to think about because yeah, I would say technically if you're doing short-term accommodation, I mean, through my years yeah. of being a digital nomad, I would rent a place for, you know, maybe one to three months or so. And, yeah. and I considered myself to be a digital nomad. I mean, you have to sleep yeah. somewhere, right? Yeah. So um, certainly at that state, you know, for you to have been experimenting with this lifestyle in Berlin is, is absolutely a, a form of a digital nomad yeah. lifestyle. Where did you go from Berlin? You went back to France after Berlin. Is that correct? Yeah, for a little while, um, because at the time, <laughs> I, that's the moment in my life that I define as trying to go into a normal life. Like, you know, after being a student, maybe you feel like, okay, fun is over. You had your year abroad and you had your fun. Now let's find a job. <laughs> and I tried to be a teacher um, because at the time it felt, I actually thought about travel at that time also. I felt maybe this is a job that can allow me to travel a lot but I was not able to pull through. Like I finished my studies, but I just, it was not possible for me to be a teacher. It, it, it's not teaching the problem that the problem was, it was the idea of just doing this same job forever and having to stay put. Even at the time I felt like this is not what I want to do, um, but I wasn't sure what else I could do. So I just went to London. <laughs> <laughs> and I worked as a waitress and uh, as a journalist after actually and uh, I studied journalism there and I did I was working whatever I could find and because it was abroad um, it was fun and so this is how it happened from London this is where I started the digital nomadism uh, career and I went to Iceland, uh, lived there a little while because it was a place that I didn't know I would love so much. And, uh, and then moved throughout Asia. Um, yeah, I moved quite a lot, but I was always on this translation gig for a while. So how many years were you on the move like that? I would say about eight years. Yeah. Wow, eight years. Total. Yeah, if we <laughs> count the expatriation, and if we count the time where I was really moving and I was staying at maybe hostels or stuff like that, I'd say maybe three years, three to four years, but it was, there had been breaks in between. Mm -hmm. But I think the longest time I was on the road nonstop was a year moving. Okay. What happened after that? So do you, do you feel that you're settled in France or are you still in transition? What's, what's happening for you now? And what perhaps did, were you inspired to come back to France to, to get a place or, you know, what brought you back to France and, and how are you feeling now? Well, I definitely feel like home are my friends uh, or my family. They are, I feel at home with um, some people that I feel comfortable with. And if all these people were to move in another country, I would go there and this would be home. So because uh, a lot of these friends are French, um, then I, I am in France. Um, but I would say I keep everything in my life so that I can go anytime, anywhere, anytime, anywhere. <laughs> and this is definitely something that, so I, even if I don't have to at the moment, and it's actually a bit absurd, but I do still make sure that everything is, my backpack is made, everything is just ready <laughs> so that I can go. And I don't do it, but the fact that I made a life that, that it allows me to do that is just, it makes me so happy. It makes me so happy because it makes me feel like the possibility is there. And even if I don't seize it, it's there. And so I guess that's just, that that's nice. <laughs> You said two things that are, are really interesting there. Uh, I mean, everything you say is interesting, but the, the two things I want to comment on is the the idea that your family and friends uh, are, are your home. Yeah. And no matter where they are, that is your home. Uh, and I can, I can personally resonate with that a lot. Um, while for many years, I didn't think that my hometown would ever be a place I would live again. Uh, by the same token, my visits home, my visits to my family and friends were really instrumental for me because it helped me understand how I've, what I've learned along the way, how I've grown, how I've changed. They would reflect back to me where I was at. In some cases, they would observe that I was maybe 
happier than I thought I was or, or sadder than I thought I was, you know, every once in a while they would say, God, Nora, you know, I'm a little bit concerned about you. And I was like, really, why, what, what's, I, I, I don't know what's happening. So they the, definitely that, that contextual baseline of those long-term relationships, those family, those friends, those people who will always accept you and, and, and who are always happy to see you is really important. And it's, it's, um, it's very heartwarming. Uh, and so it yeah. ultimately led me to, I mean, I never thought I would live in Toronto again, but here I am. And wow. Yeah. And I, I really, I, after being away for so many years, I actually really treasure my relationships now with my family and friends all the more. Yeah. Do you feel that that has happened for you as well? Yeah, for sure. Especially because I think it's one of those, you know, very cliche things that you start missing when you don't have them anymore. And traveling on, like being on the road for so long really had me realize how important it is, I think, for the human brain to be close to a network of people that you don't question or have to really like um let's say maintain like let's let if we compare human relationships to flowers it's like on the road you're always planting seeds and maybe nurturing the little seedlings and so, so they grow and but it's work it's work and you know you get maybe i mean in my opinion you get different kinds of relationships it's not the same plant and if you are along in your family like you you don't have to i think you don't have to be to it's not so much work i don't know if it's correct to say that or not it feels bad because it doesn't it's i'm not implying that you know your friends to take them for granted or not but it's just it's a different kind of like quieter a slower paced relationship where you feel like maybe more supported you you feel more seen more understood and it's just safer I mean that at least to me that's what happens and I'm not a very social person in a way I'm very shy and so these kind of relationships really when I didn't have them anymore I felt I felt like a lot of emptiness in the beginning that actually got me by surprise when I started traveling because I never knew I would it would happen to me because I wasn't even that close from my parents at the time I was younger and you know I was just I felt like I felt like my independence um I was there and then yeah when you are away from your closest friends and you know it feels very different suddenly like life feels a bit more threatening or at least that's what happened to me so this is also why after years and years of trying to understand what was happening I definitely know now that I don't think I could be a nomad forever because I think I would feel this emptiness and loneliness deep down that I usually don't feel too much if I go for a shorter period of time and I go back home. Wow. You do, to nurture it. You, you touched upon a lot of uh, great points there. And I, I think really, no matter who we are, I my contention, especially after talking to some of the people that I've spoken with in this series, my contention is that the digital nomad lifestyle, this full-time travel hardcore, <laughs> it has a shelf life. Yeah. Eventually, people people need to come off the road and and have some sense of home, whatever that might mean. So you know, for you, it's family and friends. For me, actually, it was very similar. I needed familiarity as well, the cultural familiarity of Canada. Yeah. I craved after many years of always being the yeah. the foreigner. You know, the, the the girl who has weird jokes. You know, and just, I was never fully understood uh, until I was in the company of um, my family and friends. So I understand that. Now, by the same token, though, you did say that your bag is always packed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so you're at right now, where are you at in that? Like, does everything you own still pretty much fit into a bag? I mean, it's never really been the case with me because I tend to accumulate a lot of things. I love thrift shopping, for example. I, I, I love things. <laughs> So it's, it's a bit annoying, but I'm able to part with them. And, you know, when I left London, for example, I did sell everything I owned. Um, and sometimes I even think of this time and I'm like, I kind of regret selling some of those stuff. Maybe I should have just, I realized with time that I, it's the same thing. I feel a bit better if I have some stuff that make me, that bring me comfort. So I found ways I, I left some things again like always trying to keep it to the smallest possible but like stuff here and there um and I know I can get rid of them I know it's not the end of the world but I do like to keep them but I do try to like digitalize everything like my pictures stuff like that I have this weird habit of taking pictures of stuff I like uh 
and so I can sometimes get rid of the stuff and keep all the pictures. <laughs> so it's like my home is in my computer. Uh, and even my computer, I make sure that it's always safe that you can that I can lose it and still have my stuff backed up. So I have this this notion of impermanence, I guess, uh, very strongly in me. But I also love uh, things and beautiful things. So I try not to be too hard on myself if I want to keep some stuff, um, at least for a while. I just like I just like beautiful things. So two questions here. Uh, you mentioned that you kind of regret getting rid of some things yeah. and I'm curious to what those things are. And then I'm also curious are what the things are that you kept. Yeah, so I tend to keep memories a lot, um, but it's really silly things that I regret getting rid of. I think it's because I didn't grieve, uh, grieve them because if I, if I had them today, I would probably get rid of them. But at the time <laughs> I got, yeah, it's just a bit weird, but uh, I got rid of, uh, electronics and I and one of the weird things I got rid of clothes like clo really beautiful clothing pieces of clothing that I got in London some of them I found on the, on the floor like I, I literally they were for free or they didn't have any specific value it's just I think it's because I forced myself to get rid of everything and get rid of the clothing it felt like a very easy thing to do but it was one of the hardest I learned with time that I get very attached to clothing I don't know why, but I just do. And so now I make sure that I, it's like very Marie Kondo, but I say goodbye to myself before I, I take a picture. Maybe I wear them a couple of times and then I let them go. And I'm like, okay, you can have another life. And I, I can do this with everything, but I know I need some time. And there is a moment in my mind where if I get rid of too many things in one time, I get overwhelmed and I keep everything. So I shut down and I'm like, no, no, I do. So it just, it needs to be a slow process. I, it's a bit painful for my friends sometimes to see this process because it needs to take its time, but I can get rid of everything. I took, how was it, four months at least? Actually, probably ended up being about six months to get rid of everything. And I definitely did it in stages. I did it slowly. Uh, yeah. And it was good. I couldn't imagine doing it really much faster than that because it was emotionally a process oh, to get hard. rid of everything. It was definitely cathartic. Um, but the funny thing for me was I kept, uh, it was about, I don't know, six boxes worth of things. And these were things that I either deemed to be, I mean, there was paperwork and things, you know, files and stuff that I had to keep, tax returns. Uh, yeah. and I digitized all of my photos over the years or most of them and then the the rest of the things I chose to keep were things that I considered to be priceless or irreplaceable so for me yeah. they would be things that I had accumulated on my world travels up to that date or or things that had a lot of sentimental value for me and then I had these so two years later I think I came back to these boxes and went through them and I was like wow, I really kept a lot of weird things. Like there was, yeah. and there was, and clothing were some of the things. I actually chose to keep certain pieces of clothing. And some of them I was like, why did I keep this? And others, I was like, oh, oh I'm so glad I, you know, I kept this dress. Yeah. I forgot that I kept this dress. <laughs> uh, and, and there were other pieces of clothing that I remembered that I got rid of. And I thought, why did I get rid of that? That was such a nice thing. So mm -hmm. there's definitely going to be the process. I mean, I got rid of half of my stuff again, you know, from those boxes. I thought, I don't, I don't need these things. Um, so I think what we deem to be important in any, any given moment will change. Yeah. Do you have any advice for someone who's uh, considering getting into a long-term travel? They have a remote career and they're looking at getting into a long-term travel lifestyle. If they are French or read French, I would definitely advise for them to read the, the Bible du Grand Voyageur, the, the guidebook that I wrote, because it's definitely full of advice for long-term travel. And so that for sure. But I think there's, there's probably a lot of literature that you can find um, on this matter. If there are some things that you struggle with at home, um, expect them to get harder on the road um, and expect to discover stuff about yourself that you didn't know were a problem when you were in the comforts of home and the familiarity of home. That said, it's okay. Get easy on yourself. Doesn't mean you're crazy or weak or whatever. Um, don't get competitive because travel is a competitive thing. Um, I learned that also when I traveled uh, with, when I was backpacking. I was so surprised to have you know people wearing badges of honor and I just I felt very lame in the beginning so I was, oh I don't know I didn't do this or I didn't travel that adventurously don't beat yourself up um 
it's a skill that you learn and don't expect to know it right away. Um, some people are better suited than others. I think maybe neurologically they're better at, um, I don't know, handling a lot of stimulation, learning new languages, whatever. Uh, but no matter how you struggle, doesn't mean that you're not make, made for this. Um, you're just going to learn. Uh, it's just going to take a while. And also really trust yourself. Like if you're, if you're having a bad feeling about a place, don't feel like maybe you're not tolerant enough or you know whatever just understand that maybe it's not the right place for you right now it could be in two months it could be three years but so far if you're forcing yourself to adapt and you can't um that that usually leads to bad things i would say maybe a week is a good time to try to adapt and after a week if you still not if you if it doesn't get better and you still feel like shit all the time maybe change environment or change pace or change your surroundings people around you change something um because it's you you won't adapt by forcing yourself uh in a place so that's definitely but that, that would definitely go with any kind of lifestyle change um just allow yourself to be surprised and um maybe read about stuff that you know you see coming like let's say if you feel like maybe you're getting very anxious uh go straight dive into books about anxiety for example maybe don't wait for it to get too big because many things today are very documented so you can have these problems that are very short term instead of just uh go with uh like a heavy you know like <sighs> God, it's so hard to have i don't have these expressions that are so great in french but, you know, like having to lift an extra backpack of uh, anxiety on top of your backpack is just, um, you can, you, you, you don't have to today because there are so many resources. So tackle things one thing at a time. And yeah, things take time. And yeah, and you're going to be disappointed by stuff because travel, real life travel is very different from imagination travel. And also that's okay. And try to kind of look at the little things that um, that are even better than when you expected and cherish them because uh, you're going to need them because in the beginning you're going to have a shock or I, I mean I think most people do and if you don't then you're lucky. <laughs> this is incredible advice and not I mean it, it's life advice but it's also these are really amazing lessons that you've learned on the road. Uh, from anything from, you know, not wanting to the badges of honor and country counting and, you know, yeah. feeling that you're a lesser person because you didn't experience something that some other traveler experienced, really coming home to yourself, knowing what resonates for you and being able to act on that, whether something is, you know, if a place doesn't feel right for you, then learn to change your circumstances accordingly and, and making sure and also being aware that if there's, there's a, an expression that I love, which is wherever you go, there you are. So, uh, you know, you're definitely on the road going to learn more about yourself, uh, strengths and weaknesses, and to be kind to yourself in so doing. These are, these are really great lessons. One last question for you. Uh, do you have any advice for people who are remote working while traveling? Because you did that for many years and it's not always very easy. Uh, what would you say to someone who's looking at taking their job on the road? Uh, the hardest thing for me was uh, the fact that I, at the beginning, I didn't have colleagues. I, I did have some colleagues, but they were not traveling when they were working. So they didn't have all these problems that I was experiencing. And my travel companions were um, just traveling and then going back home. So I felt quite lonely in this. Um, at the same time, I'd say, um, I think making a guidebook of what you consider work, what you consider play, and then having this very strong set of boundaries. I think planning in advance what you think is acceptable and what you think is too much definitely helps. So if you say, okay, I think I should work six hours a day, um, having, this, having this written somewhere is definitely helpful because it helps you have a sense of what you considered normal before leaving and then what maybe you will adapt it or not but um it's um it's important to i think think things through before um 
I'm trying to think as a, it's kind of hard because now it's everywhere <laughs> and very good advice. <laughs> I, I made all the mistakes. So maybe a mistake that I made that um, learning that I am a terrible uh, worker when it comes to sensory overload. I have to work with, uh, um, you know, very strong headphones with uh, the, the noise cancelling headphones. Um, I need to be in a place where there is no movement. So if people go come and go, then it's distracting. So I just basically need an office. <laughs> so you, you can just make your office with, uh, you know, I, I used to sometimes like a scarf to just make myself a bubble. <laughs> so it's just that. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also just rituals. So if you need to work, uh, set up your little office. I have my set of routines that I um, that I use. I, I read The Power of Habit from Charles Duhigg and that book helped me uh, create cues, rewards, and then I set up a, a routine for uh, for when to, to say to my brain that it's time to work um, and to say to my brain when it's time to stop thinking about work. So I, I do this and uh, it's just kind of self-help. I, I learned a lot of my stuff from self-help books. And um, now, nowadays, I I just think that it's the hardest thing is work-life balance. Um, but I think it's for everyone on the road or not. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think all of your advice applies to being on the road uh, as well as being at home. You know what amazes me, you and I are very similar in that I need a I need a concentrated environment with minimal distractions. And I'm always amazed at people who like to work in coffee shops because yeah. my productivity just plummets when I go to a coffee shop because I'm looking around, I've got yeah. music playing. I mean, there's so many reasons why I can't get into a zone. Uh, and your advice to create very solid boundaries. This is work time. This is not work time, this is play time. And to be able, for me personally, I also create a, a separate environment for my work. So yeah. I have this desk. When I sit at this chair at this desk, I am working full yeah. stop. When I'm not in this chair, I'm not working. And uh, that that's also really good advice, not only for on the road, but also at home. If you can create that dedicated workspace, then it's much easier to get into the headspace for work. Uh, and then also learning to be able to shut it off because I think, for a lot of people, there's two problems with remote work. One is turning it on and being disciplined and focused while you're working. And then the other yeah. one is turning it off. Yeah, I think certainly leaving off work at work. So hard. Yeah, yeah. Turning it off is definitely one of the hardest, I, I would say. And um, also, I would definitely advise uh, turning notifications off when you're not working. Maybe leaving the notifications on for like an extra hour, just in case your colleagues just hang out on Slack or whatnot. Um, but then, yeah, that's important because I um, identify as an introvert and just having these notifications sometimes feel like work <laughs> and just entertaining some relationships or the, it's just, it's not really resting. So when you are on the road, you, you do, I think, have this craving even more for relationships, but it's not always um relaxing so i 100 strong boundaries for notifications excellent excellent advice very good thank you i really appreciate that do you have any final words for us today if you're still here thank you very much for bearing through <laughs> my accent especially oh, your accent is delightful i don't know it's if i stutter i just i'm missing there is so much more i would like to say to subjects i'm passionate about but i do hope that i was clear enough and uh and yeah, thank you for listening and go ahead and, you know, you're going to get there. It's going to be great. <laughs> thank you so much, Isabel. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with me today. Thank you. I'm Nora Dunn and I'm otherwise known as the professional hobo and I will catch you next time. <laughs>